Okay, so I am so excited to be joined by Merritt Elizabeth. She is a certified eating disorder recovery coach. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for being on today. And I can't wait to have this chat. Yeah, thanks for having me. Like I told you before we hopped on, I think your podcast is fantastic. So oh, I'm honored to be a part of it. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much. I, it's, I, I poured my heart and soul to it. So it really means a lot oh, to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So let's jump right into it because one thing that I think is just so fascinating about so many people who have shared experiences, especially with eating disorders is their story. So would you mind just sharing your story of like, where have you come from? What brought you to the point where now you are helping others who have an eating disorder? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Whenever people ask this, I don't really always know where to start because looking yeah. back so much of it is a blur. <laughs> oh, I hear you. It yeah. really is. So I think the easiest place to start is when I developed my eating disorder and that was in my adolescence. So probably around 14, 15, right around the time Instagram came out. I always talk about how social media was such a big part of why I developed my eating disorder, you know, yeah. the comparison and just no, not feeling good enough comparing yourself to people on the internet. And so I really struggled all throughout my adolescence, all throughout college. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was a nightmare going from that transition to not really getting any help in high school, then to going to the college environment. It just made things a hundred times worse. Mm -hmm. um, I struggled with bulimia. I probably should have started with that. Uh, <laughs> but that was, that was my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And it, like I said, a lot of it, my eating disorder was a blur. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pre pretty crazy to look back on those times and just not remember chunks of my life because I was so yeah. not there. I wasn't present during any of it. Yeah. Um, I got treatment in Dallas where I went to college. I went to SMU mm -hmm. and I had a treatment team. I did IOP where I went to class part-time. I went to treatment part-time and that was kind of the way I made it work because I wanted to stay a full-time student. Um, and it was really challenging. I I didn't totally relate to my treatment team. It was really hard to not be around someone with lived experience, mm -hmm. um, specifically bulimia, because it is just such a difficult disease to understand. And there's so much shame and guilt surrounding it. Really? Um, mm -hmm. I, sorry, if I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, it's like, how do I fit this entire story into, oh, I know. I could. into a few sentences? It's hard. Yeah. Um, I, I really found recovery through science through spirituality, um, meditation, learning mindfulness techniques. That was a huge part of my journey, just learning to be more present in my life. Um, I was really motivated by getting out of Dallas, graduating college and going to do something new, being exposed to a new environment. And I moved to LA. I, this was after I found full recovery and I was working in the fashion industry and I realized it was not the most life-giving job. It was fulfilling, but not fulfilling enough that I could do it for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I moved back to Dallas to get my master's degree in health promotion management from SMU. Um, I got my certification from the Carolyn Costin Institute in eating disorder recovery coaching. And now I'm here. That's awesome. So that was a quick, a quick answer to the yes. question where I came from and where I'm, where I am now. Yeah. And we'll probably delve into even more like yeah. detail with that big, oh, but yeah. I completely, I like how you, I mean, re said that it is a blur because I have felt like that too. And I believe me, it was also what I struggled with. So I completely understand that. Like, I'm like, how could I not remember such mm -hmm. poignant parts of my life? Yeah. Like how, does that not stand out? And like, there's bits and pieces that are very vivid. And then a lot of it is just kind of yes. a blur. So yeah, it, it's, it's interesting how our brains work. I don't know if it's a protective mechanism that we just kind of forget some of those really dark places or, or what it is, or just that we're so fulfilled. We're so full of like stress that it's like, right. we're not processing things. And it's even feels shameful to admit that parts of it were a blur too. Yeah. Like it's even hard to say that. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it really is, um, it's it impacts your life in so many ways that it's like, there's also, I don't know if you experienced this too, the regret of like, oh my gosh, how many years went by that you feel like you weren't even living your life. Like yeah. do you feel that from those? Oh moments? yeah. Yeah. Of course I feel that, especially not being healed in college where it's like, there's, you could have made so many great connections yes. and found deeper friendships, but obviously, you know, I, you can't have any regrets, right? That's life. Yeah. I'm here now because of what I went through, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I completely relate to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And 
what would you say, like when you were going through the eating disorder, what would you say, how your mindset was then to what your mindset is now? Like, how has that transitioned or transformed? Well, it's transformed a lot. I can say that my mindset in recovery was so focused on negativity Mm -hmm. and my mindset now is so much more focused on positivity. I'm not perfect. (laughs) I don't always see positivity, but it's something that I strive for in my everyday life. Um, really, I always tell my clients to, you know, a big part of recovery is seeking positive thoughts, positive experiences, positive feelings. And I was so, my brain was so wired to find the negative in every situation when I was in my eating disorder. Mm-hmm. And so I had to shift that. I had to learn to be a more positive, happy person, you know, in order to get to full recovery. Wow. I could talk about mindset forever. I, I mean, I think yeah. meditation had a huge, huge part of shifting my mindset. Um, yeah. I think just adding more mindfulness to my life in general, just trying to be present in every single situation, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And especially meditation, like, do you mind just kind of elaborating on that? Because I know for so many people, like they want meditation to work, but it's such a difficult thing when you have such a negative brain to get into a place where you have to quiet your mind because, Mm -hmm. and I struggle with this too. It's like you get, try to meditate, but all you hear are more of the same thoughts. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about how you got to a point where you found meditation to be beneficial to you? Yeah. I think you have to start from a place of acceptance. You can't go into it thinking you're going to hate it. It's going to be terrible. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help you if that's your mindset. And that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. I think you have to approach, you know, your first meditation when you're not feeling anxious, when you're not feeling panicked, maybe when you're in a more neutral grounded place. And I mean, you can start with your eyes open. You can start with meditating for two minutes and the art of meditation. I mean, it's just being still being present. So finding a comfortable place, you know, even if it's just in your bed and just finding two minutes to be totally still silent, observe your thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. And there's so many different forms of meditation. There is something out there for everyone. I mean, there really is. I, I prefer a guided meditation. I like music. I like hearing someone talk to me, um, while I'm meditating. That's really powerful. I like reciting a mantra, but like I said, I mean, there's so many different forms of meditation. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that you brought out that you have to be in a place where you can receive it because if you're trying to fight yourself to quiet your brain, you're in a really tough place. It's going to, you're just going to meet resistance and then Mm -hmm. frustration. So that's such an important point to bring up, like when you are, when it's appropriate for you and what moments. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's again, just learning yourself and like what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. I also love breath work. Mm -hmm. I discovered breath work after my eating disorder recovery, I, I discovered it actually recently. And it's been so helpful for me, especially with emotional release. And I find it to be such a interesting, amazing experience. I mean, what your body goes through when you are in an intense breath work session is pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's such a channel to get your brain into a different place and your nervous system into a different place. So it's, it really is such a profound tool. And I think it's really underrated in some, you know, when people don't know how powerful it is, it's very underrated, like, oh, just breathe. But there's so many ways to do that, that serve you. So absolutely. Since we're talking about a lot of like the self-care routine, can you kind of talk, like run us through what your typical day looks like? Like, how do you take care of yourself on a daily basis and make that consistent? Yeah. I love this question, especially because I talk about it with my clients so much. You Mm -hmm. have to have a positive morning and a night routine Mm -hmm. because it, you know, it sets the tone for your day and then a positive night routine, you're reflecting on your day. What can I do better tomorrow? So morning and night routine is a huge part of my self-care. I like to start by (laughs) waking up slow, Mm -hmm. um, waking up to, this is so specific and random, but waking up to a sound that actually is pleasant to hear made such a difference for me in my self-care routine, rather than waking up to just a horrible, like alarming sound. Yes, um, I like to get specific when I talk routines. So I'm doing yeah. that now. Oh, absolutely. Um, going into my skincare, I struggled with acne so much in my eating disorder. And so taking care of my skin is a huge part of my self-care now, always making sure that, you know, I'm being kind to my skin and, you know, changing products. If I need to, I, I feel super in tune with my body now. And that, that includes my skin. Um, I think a lot of individuals will relate to having super sensitive skin, those who've struggled with eating disorders too. And that's definitely who I am. 
Um, besides, I mean, your self-care routine is so much more than skincare too. So I don't want to get stuck on that, but I will definitely do some kind of morning meditation, um, releasing anxiety, starting my day off on a positive note, a meditation along those lines. Uh, not every day I try to, but I try to do some kind of mindful walk, you know, being in the fresh air makes a huge difference in my mental health. Oh, absolutely. Even if it's cold, even if it's cloudy, it's just getting outside of my apartment and being, you know, being outside in the fresh air, it makes a huge difference for me. Yeah. I mean, there's always some form of mindfulness, some form of being present in my self-care. It might look different every day and that's okay. Um, but I always have some form of mindfulness. Yeah. Uh, my, my nighttime routine is really similar, you know, taking care of my skin, maybe taking a warm bath and just doing something to, to ground me, whether it is breath work, whether it is meditation, I have a really amazing meditation studio here in Dallas called breathe meditation and wellness. So I feel very blessed that I get to go in person, you know, in their amazing wellness rooms, they have two rooms, inhale and exhale, and it is just so peaceful. And there's something different about being able to meditate in a communal space too. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It's and that's so nice too, because again, just having that like social interaction too, is just so healing for people as well, especially when you have common goals. That's, that's amazing that you have that available mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I love how, you know, you talk about the beginning of the day and the end of the day, because really bookending our days with things that are more in our control to help and serve ourselves is, is so important because sometimes in the middle of the day, we can't control things. We can't, you know, things can get awry. We can lose our time. But if you know that you start your day and you end your day with something that, you know, is serving you, I, I think it absolutely helps you get through your day. Yeah. So, I yeah. agree with you. I want to add to that too. Yeah. Uh, as, as an introvert, it's so easy for me to isolate myself, for me to stay at home, <laughs> especially being able to use being tired as an excuse. And so a lot of people, when they think of self-care, they think of like, staying in on Friday and Saturday nights and wanting to be alone and take time just for yourself. And for me, it's actually the opposite. As an introvert, I need to also make space to be able to see people and interact with other humans because it is so easy for me to naturally isolate myself. And I think that's a big part of my self-care routine as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like how you brought that up because self-care it's, it's so broad, but yet, like, yeah. I think a lot of times people genuinely think that self-care is like, oh, I'll just you know, go have a glass of wine after a hard day or just go to the spa. And, and sometimes those things just become numbing. They're not actually addressing and helping and serving yourself. So I like how you know yourself well enough that you can implement other things that you know you need mm -hmm. to become more fulfilled. So yeah. you know, that really exemplifies self-care where you know what your needs are and then you actually show up for yourself and, and allow yourself to have that. So that's a, an amazing point to bring up there. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. random, but, and it's taken me a long time to get to a point where I know myself so well that I know what I need, but yeah. self-care is it's the art of taking care of yourself and you know yourself best. And when you really listen to your body and tune in, you know, your, your body will tell you what it needs. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and which brings us to the next point I, I want to make is that, do you, did you feel or experience this? Cause this is something I experienced with eating disorder that you completely lost connection with yourself when you were going through the eating disorder. Did you feel like you don't even know yourself? You don't know what brings you joy. You don't know how to help yourself. Oh my you God. Your body. Yeah. Of course. I didn't know anything about myself or at le least I had lost touch with every part of who I was in my yeah. eating disorder. I mean, I think the way you just described it is perfectly how I would describe myself in my eating disorder. I mean, yeah. I just, I didn't know myself at all. It was kind of like I had to recreate my identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and it's so interesting because again, how our brains work, but I've had a few uh, people on as guests who have experienced eating disorders. And I think we all kind of said this and, and let me know if you, if this resonates with you, but you, when you talk about how you were, when you're going through the eating disorder, does it almost feel like it was a different person then? Than who oh, you were? yeah. Yeah. I mean, 100%, it was a different person it, that that's the best way to yeah. say it. that wasn't me. That wasn't my, my highest self, my truest self mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. And, and it's hard to look back and it's hard to admit that, but that's the truth. That wasn't who I was, who I am, who I was supposed to be right. The best version yeah. of myself. And I had to create the best version of myself. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's really hard. <laughs> it is. It's challenging. Absolutely. Yes. It's, it's yeah. Not downplaying anything. It's, it is a challenge, but it's a very rewarding challenge because mm-hmm. you find things out about yourself that are just amazing. And you're like, why did I hide this for so long? You know, you do. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the, the exercises that helped me the most was literally just writing a list of my values, what I valued in life, what I wanted people to remember me by, you know, I always talk to my clients about what do you want people to say at your funeral, right? Like, do you want people to go up and say she was so committed to her workout routine, right? They were, they were so adamant about being skinny. It was so admirable. No, you don't want to hear that. No one's going to say that, right? Mm -hmm. You want people to remember you for being kind, for being a good listener, for being an honest friend, right? And so doing that exercise and reminding of myself of that over and over was really helpful. And I think that helped create who I am today. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that exercise too, because it really just, it reframes the way you're living your life and makes you question what you're doing. Because sometimes when you're in an eating disorder, you don't ever take a moment to question what those thoughts are that are going through your head, you live them. And and I love that. What a great exercise to do to bring some awareness to that kind of going off of that, what do you feel like were some of the subconscious messages or limiting beliefs that you had in during the eating disorder that you feel like kind of kept you in the eating disorder? So many, but I think the biggest one for me was I kept telling myself my, I believe other people can recover, but my disorder is so different. No one will ever understand. You know, I'm just the one person that can't recover. And when you tell yourself that over and over and over, you know, you really, really believe it. And so Mm -hmm. it took a long time for me to break free of that limiting belief and say, why would I be the one person in the world who can't recover? Why? Yeah. I'm not. Hint, you're not, you know, (laughs) I mean, it's, it sounds harsh, but that's the ego talking. That's not you. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And I'm sure there are so many people listening be like, yes, I feel the same way. Like there's something innately wrong with me. It's not that I have something that is hindering me or holding me back. There's something innately wrong with me. So it's like, when you have those beliefs, it's like, you don't think anything is going to help. So thank you for bringing awareness to that, because I know so many Mm -hmm. people that feel that way when they're in the thick of their eating disorder. Right. And then again, if you are telling yourself that message, you're closing yourself off to believing anything else. And Mm -hmm. then you're keeping yourself in that mindset. Yeah. And you stay stuck stuck in that cycle of believing and acting on the behaviors, right? Yes, totally. And going back to when you were going through the eating disorder, what would you say to your, your younger self with the mindset that you have now? Like, what would you tell her when she's going through that and to bring kind of a light to what she's doing or how she's feeling? Like, what would you tell that girl if, if you had to say something to her? I think I would say that you have the power to change and it takes one small step in the right direction every single day. It doesn't matter how small the step is, but you have to take one small step every single day to get to that path of full recovery. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and it is, it is those small compounding actions that turn out to be a new trajectory for yourself. So yeah, it's like, you can't overwhelm yourself with this overhaul of life. You have to just do what you can each day. So yes, what a great message. And one thing um, I kind of want to go back to is I, with like eating disorders, they're they're so prevalent now. There's so many people that are going through eating disorders, especially, you know, after going through this pandemic, everyone has at a heightened level of anxiety and stress and, and depression. There's a lot of mental health issues and, and sometimes an eating disorder in many cases is a way to cope with that. So, um, what do you think needs to change in the future of eating disorders so that, recovery so that the prevalence does not become kind of exacerbated as it has been. Well, you know, it's funny because I was talking about this with my client today Mm -hmm. and they gave me a really great answer and they're neurodivergent. They had said that we need to make space for neurodivergent people in the classic treatment model. Mm -hmm. And there's such a strong correlation between neurodivergence and eating disorders that these people should not be the exception. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nearly 20% of people with ARFID also have autism. 
Yeah. And we need to make treatment more inclusive, more individualized, more accessible. And I think it starts there. I see so many people slipping through the recovery care, care cracks, and it's just unfair. Yeah. You know, the classic treatment model, it's not, it's not working anymore. We need something different. And I think I'll add to that. I think we also need more virtual care options. What Equip is doing is amazing. And mm -hmm. We need more programs that cater to people recovering in their home too, yeah. because not everyone has access to be able to leave, you know, to be able to leave and go somewhere to get treatment. Absolutely. Yes. I love that. And I, I couldn't agree more. I, the accessibility to care really needs to be mm -hmm. increased and, and also financially more accessible too. Mm -hmm. you know, allow people to be able to recover, but like just the virtual care alone. Um, you know, I, I so wish there was as many resources back when I was going through it as there are now, but we need more because clearly the numbers keep on increasing and yet, you know, there's just, it, it's not where it needs to be to right. counter this, you know, it's clearly there's, there's a bigger issue here. So yes, I, I absolutely believe what you said. Accessibility needs to be there. It does. Yeah. I mean, if everything was perfect, if the treatment model now was amazing, there wouldn't be rising statistics in eating disorders, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that the stigma and the belief around eating disorder is, is still out there that this is a lack of control issue, or this is just because people want to be thin or skinny. It's like, there are yeah. so many deeper reasons why people engage in disorder eating behaviors that yeah need to be understood better. Mm -hmm. And I, I think having conversations like this and people who are willing to share their story and say like, this is what I experienced day in and day out. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. I'm not a Merriam Webster dictionary, you know, eating disorder. Like that's what people see as an eating disorder. Like, oh, you do these behaviors, but there's yes. so many layers deeper to that. The day in and day out struggles, the mindset, the, the beliefs, the, um, the shame, the guilt that you constantly feel, the internal battles that are going on. And I think the more that that's discussed and brought out to the open, I think the better people will understand like how impactful having an eating disorder really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I completely agree with you. Well said. Yeah. Yep. When you were going through your recovery, did you feel like you had a pivotal moment, like something that really opened your eyes? Like, I don't want to live like this anymore. Mm -hmm. did, did you mind sharing that? Yeah. Someone asked me that yesterday. So yeah. it's funny. I was yeah. really thinking about this and I don't know if it was for me, this big switch, this light bulb moment, because mm -hmm. I don't think that's what it was for me. I think it was more of a fade of adding in these really positive behaviors into my life, getting more excited, excited about the possibility of, of creating a better, more positive future. I think that all kind of added up to my full recovery. Mm. And so I wouldn't say it was like a light bulb moment where I was like, aha, I want to recover. But I think it was everything that I was doing already in recovery, no matter how small that added together to maybe add up slowly to full recovery, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it, I think it's very real. I mean, I feel like that probably happens more than people have this like epiphany and like, mm -hmm. oh, I want to change. Like that probably doesn't happen as often as maybe people think happen. Yeah. It, it, it's not know. this like big shift. It's like, okay, I, I have a different vision for my life. How do I get there? And you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to get there, but you just know you want it and yeah. you figure it out somehow. Exactly. And, yeah. And kind of crawl out of the hole, the hole, instead of digging the hole, you kind of crawl out of it. And, mm -hmm. and then sometimes you fall back in it, but you crawl back out, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a good that's way of putting it. it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's true. That was definitely true for me. Yes. Yeah. Same with me. It's not a linear journey. It's not like you say, I'm not, I'm going to try to work my way out of this eating disorder. And then you just do, it's like, you have, no. you have, you know, days that are harder than others and you go back to the same behaviors. But I think when you expect that and know, that's just part of normal recovery, like it makes mm -hmm. it easier to kind of move past that and not let it keep pushing you down. Yeah. So Yeah. 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 Um, and then I, one other, one other thing I kind of want to like ask you is that, what do you think from the people you work with, what have you seen is the biggest obstacle people face in recovery? Like, why is it so difficult for people to recover in your opinion? I think it's a lot of my clients. I see that limiting belief of I'm the one person who can't recover. You know, I'm that one special person and we have to 
educate ourselves on the ego versus the soul, you know, that fear, that anxiety, that worry, those Mm -hmm. limiting beliefs that comes from the ego and your soul, your highest self is all about love, honesty, truth. And it, your soul knows that the eating disorder isn't who you are. Mm -hmm. And so I think a big part of this eating disorder recovery is repairing that mind, body, soul connection. Yeah. Everyone struggling with an eating disorder has some kind of disconnect mind, body, and soul. Yeah. Oh, completely. Yeah, absolutely. And I love how you, you talk about the soul because it is our energy. Like our energy is, is not designed to be robotic, robotic and be controlled by feeling less than what we really are. So yeah. it's like you can, when you can tune into what you were destined to be and find that purpose and, and tap into the higher energies, I think absolutely you're well on your way to get being in a better place. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. For someone who's listening to this and is like, I'm in a really tough place. I just need to do something, but I don't know what to do. Where would you recommend starting when Mm -hmm. with recovery? I always have people make some sort of vision board, whether that's digital, whether that's physical, you may not know, you know, exactly what you want your future life to look like, but you have to start somewhere. You know that what you don't want is what you're living right now. So what does sound like an amazing future? You know, in your wildest dreams, what would make you the happiest person possible? And start there because if you can think it, you can create it. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And and just the word create is like, you have to be the creator of your life. Like you're Mm -hmm. not a victim of your circumstances. You're literally the creator and and you can, you have the power to change it at any point Mm -hmm. in your life. For yeah. someone who wanted to connect with you and maybe get coaching from you, how can someone find you? Yeah, my website, my Instagram, Facebook, everything is Merit Elizabeth Recovery. So mm-hmm. I kept it really simple. I'm active on Instagram. Um, my website, Merit Elizabeth Recovery, that's how you know you can inquire about any kind of coaching. And I also have a, an Etsy shop called the Happy Recovery Shop, and I sell body positive loungewear. It's super fun, awesome. and I will I'll make a discount code too, so that I you can put that in the show notes. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I'll put that all in the show notes for anyone who wants to connect to Merit. Definitely do so. She has awesome content. Definitely you. something you definitely want to watch a lot of because there's just so many messages that oh, are well, <laughs> So it's really, it is. It's a great account. I will definitely put everything in the show notes for anyone who wants to connect with you. And thank you again for being on today. It's been such a pleasure to have this conversation and, and share it with our listeners. Yeah. This was fun. This was casual. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and for everyone listening, um, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the podcast and uh, leave a review. And if you have a question for Mayor or myself, please feel free to leave that and we would be happy to answer that for you. So thank you again for spending your precious time with us. And thank you again, Mary, for being on. Thank you. Yes, absolutely.